Hello and welcome to today's European SharePoint Office 365 and Azure Community Webinar. My name is Orla and I'm delighted to be joined by Michael Johnson from Microsoft in Denmark, who will be talking to you today about Azure Monitor for the Enterprise. Remember to join the conversation about today's webinar on Twitter. Our Twitter handle is at EuropeanSP and our hashtag is ESPC22. Don't forget to check out the Resource Centre. This is updated daily with the latest blogs, ebooks, webinars, and how to videos. Simply visit SharePointEurope.com and click the content link at the top. Continue your learning by joining us again tomorrow for two webinars. Supercharge your AKS, AKS development with GitOps and Flux V2 by Geert Bake from De Kronos. Um, and Azure Hybrid. Azure is Hybrid by Design by Lisa Clark from Dell Technologies in the UK. Find out more at sharepointeurope.com forward slash Azure hyphen week. Deep dive into topics of your choice with the ESPC 22 tutorials. Experience a full day expert led workshop on the SharePoint framework, search security, AI, hybrid work, Azure Arc, Microsoft 365 or Microsoft Viva. Find out more at sharepointeurope.com forward slash ESPC22 hyphen tutorials. Our ESPC22 early bird sale is now on. Save 200 euros on three and four day tickets. Find out more at sharepointeurope.com. After the webinar, we will have a questions and answers session. Type any question you have in the questions window. Questions will be selected and answered at the end of the presentation. This webinar will be recorded and added to the Resource Center where you will be notified by email when it's available. And now I'm going to pass you over to our presenter, Michael. Hello, Michael. Hello, Orla. Orla. Just a moment. Show the screen. Are you seeing my screen or? Yes, perfect. Yep, I can see oh, your is. slides and your demo there. Yeah. Perfect. Then I'll start. So, this is a session Azure Monitor for the Enterprise, and uh, yeah, it's a it's a a really broad topic uh, so let's see if I can cover it all uh, and in short terms if it's an enterprise uh, the monitoring just gets more complex uh, and if you're going to monitor anything it needs to it's pretty crucial that you have it under control you need to know uh, if something failed when it failed and why it failed uh, in best cases you can be proactive, but in most cases, you will be reactive when something fails. Uh, and if you look at an enterprise scenario, you need to see that the right people and the right teams are notified and that they, they have access to see the correct things. Uh, you need to automate uh, most of the estate, and this is where most of the complexities comes in in an enterprise role. So, uh, <clears throat> My name is Michael. I'm a senior uh, cloud solution architect at FSI, uh, for, that's Financial uh, Industries, uh, Microsoft Denmark. I'm a former MVP. I run a community together with two uh, former MVPs. Uh, former, I am the former one, they are the current ones, MVPs. Uh, and we are called Asha Skåne. Uh, we have a hashtag that you can look up and see what we're doing. Uh, you reach me usually on Twitter. I have a blog, not really active at the moment, uh, or you can reach out on Twitter. Uh, so today's agenda, uh, quickly go through Azure Monitor at a glance, what it is, the different capabilities that it offers. Uh, we have uh, the application insights uh, for applications, uh, the agents that you can use to monitor the hybrid estate and the containers. We will cover diagnostic logs and how you enable it at scale. The topics that are highlighted in green are the ones I will do a little bit deeper dive in 
and hopefully this uh, is where the value is added to you. As I said, Azure Monitor is a really big uh, product uh, and uh, hopefully we will cover some of the questions, question marks that current uh, implementations have. So Azure Monitor at a glance. <clears throat> Azure Monitor actually it's not a it's not something that you deploy. It's there as soon as you create an Azure subscription. The activity log in that subscription starts collecting events and you can uh, <clears throat> you can use Azure Monitor to look at it. Azure Monitor is actually like the umbrella for a lot of uh, different uh, uh, services but it is log driven and uh, metrics driven. Uh, if you look on the left hand side, you can see that if you have any applications that you wanna do monitoring on, on the application level, you can uh, enable something called application insights and that you can do in the code. You can put it in code that send any logs to application insights. And then there's a lot of uh, good tools and and other services within the application insights that will help you triage any problems or get just general help on you if we then look at the infrastructure components those are enabled by agents and uh, here you can uh, install agents on your virtual machines uh, actually on your hybrid machines if you also have them arc enabled it's uh, more seamless uh, set up. Uh, as it says, it's workload agnostic, so it doesn't matter if you have your premises or other premises, it can be different clouds, uh, Google, Amazon, IBM, Alibaba, and your Hyper-V or virtual or VMware. Uh, then we look at the one that says zero instrumentation. Uh, in my mind, it's not zero instrumentation, but the Azure resources. So all the Azure resources are collecting metrics by default. Uh, when it says zero instrumentation, this is where I kind of uh, oppose a little bit because if you want the logs, there is orchestration to be done. Uh, it says subscription and tenant, and uh, this is something that we will cover also uh, where there's a, a small thing that you need to consider, especially if you're on the enterprise level. And then you have custom sources. If you, for example, can capture some logs from a top of the rack switch or something else that you have on premise, you could, you could uh, ingest that information into Azure Monitor. Uh, if you look at the bottom of the screen, you can see I, I listed Azure Advisor. Uh, policy, Defender, and Sentinel. Those are not directly uh, under Azure Monitor umbrella, but uh, they give a holistic picture. And uh, the policy is the enabling one. The Azure Advisor is there to give you a lot of logic and information about what you can, for example, cost, uh, how you can save some costs. Uh, Sentinel is uh, driven by log analytics workspaces and uh, that's a crucial part of the Azure Monitor uh, log collection. If we look on the right hand side it states that I, the Azure Monitor you can drive insights from the application container, VM network and so on. You visualize it with a lot of different tools uh, or services. Uh, you can analyze, uh, respond and integrate to third-party tools uh, if you have other SIEM systems or uh, ITSM tools, that uh, ITSM systems that you use, so you can integrate those. Yeah, let's go forward. So this is just Azure Monitor at a glance, so we'll uh, quickly go through this because, yeah, I think the other, other stuff is more interesting. <laughs> uh, application Insights, <clears throat> it tells you uh, if you have it enabled, and you connect it to your application, you get a lot of information about your application. The health, you can create alerting on it. There's some visualizations uh, that tells you 
uh, how much traffic is flowing, how many calls are being made and so on. Uh, you can also do a really deep dive analysis and tracking and go down to the <clears throat> call stack level and we will actually see this. Uh, then if we look at the, the infrastructure part, uh, the VM and the hybrid monitoring, it's enabled by something called Azure Monitoring Agent. Uh, There's an MMA agent that you probably use today from the SCOM times. Uh, you can have those side by side because uh, AMA agent is not feature parity uh, with the SCOM agent. M uh, AMA agent is not feature parity with the MMA agent yet. But it's the sim similar thing here. You can collect uh, the logs and uh, drive a <clears throat> logic from that. You get a lot of uh, information about health and you can do preventive and predictive uh, actions on it. It also gives uh, a really cool uh, map, connectivity map with dependencies, uh, as you see on the left-hand side. If we talk about containers then, which is where actually most of the monitoring is, uh, is growing at the moment, there's a lot of insights on the clusters, AKA clusters, but also on the containers, uh, Azure Container Instances. You can enable uh, Azure Monitor to get a, a ton of information and to give you the, the, yeah, the perfect picture perfect picture about how your uh, state is, is, is currently going. Mm, we will actually, I have a, I can show you some of these. And then we come to the Azure stuff. And this is where it said zero instrumentation, but here we actually have uh, on the resource diagnostics, that's, that's uh, almost on each, uh, service that you use, storage, virtual machine, uh, a, a firewall, Azure firewall or something else, you can enable diagnostics. And these diagnostics you can send to somewhere. Uh, usually it's a log analytics workspace, uh, but as it said, zero instrumentation, I believe there are some instrumentation in that case. And uh, the things that are highlighted in green here is something that the uh, Middle East enterprises should be looking at. Uh, I'll try to open up uh, another page here. So we're gonna look at the subscription. Hopefully this is visible. I'll zoom in a little bit. <clears throat> so for example, on the subscriptions, if you want to monitor the subscriptions, you can see that uh, there's an activity log here that tells me what's happening on this subscription level. It's all the activities. Uh, you would, you as an enterprise need to and want to uh, monitor this. And this is where you can actually use the diagnostic settings. If you enable this, you get these logs. Uh, based on your activity <clears throat> subscription. So you get the administrative, security, service health, alert, recommendation, policy, auto scales, and all of this uh, collected. And the, <clears throat> if I would enable this, I can actually choose uh, which ones I wanna enable. And I can also choose where I want to send them. And here you can see I can send them to a party, partner solution if I have that. You can stream it to an event hub and build further logic after that. Uh, if I archive it to a storage account, I can surface it later and I might have some regulatory needs that I, like any subscription, if, if you would look at subscription as your data center, for example, uh, you need to have activity logs happen, uh, from your data center uh, for your audit purposes, you could use this one. Uh, you can see I can also send it to multiple places. If I enable this and I send it to log analytics, I can uh, do queries on it later. And I have uh, all the data stored somewhere. 
that's on the subscriptions. <clears throat> but then you also have something called tenant, um, Azure tenant based on the management groups. And this is where you get a lot of um, entries about if you do um, new RBAC assignments or, or remove assignments on RBAC, uh, any policies that are being pushed and so on. And those actually uh, go to the activity log on the management group level. And uh, I will try to show that also. And uh, this is where, where it gets a little bit uh, messy because, uh, yeah, I don't have uh, that management group access on my uh, Microsoft tenant, so I'm, I'm, I'm using my MSD in here. And if I look here, you can see I have a tenant root group. And if I look at this activity log, if I would uh, do any RBAC, et cetera, on this one, <clears throat> it will surface here uh, if I assign policies. And then I figure, okay, I can just do as I do with the activity log on the subscription level, <clears throat> but it doesn't really work like that. Here you can enable it for other services. So what you need to do is you need to download a CSV with these ones. And if you're gonna manually do that, download a CSV every day or several times a day, uh, ingest it in a log analytics workspace or similar, it will take uh, a lot of effort and time. So you naturally need to automate that. This is something that the product groups are probably looking at at the moment. And uh, there is actually a, a colleague that has built a solution that you can, uh, you can, yeah, try out if you want to. It's based on log, uh, uh, yeah, <laughs> if you want to have it. So, um, that's one of the gotchas for a uh, enterprise tenant level. Um, and then of course you need to automate and you need to deploy it at scale. If you do it on the application level, uh, it's the SDKs, you just enable it there. There's a really good guidance on it, uh, documentation on it. Um, for the virtual machines, there's pretty easy to do from the portal, but if you're a bigger uh, uh, bigger shop, you probably would, uh, you definitely need to automate it. And there's several ways to do it. You can do it with policy, push out uh, on the management group level, you define a policy and push it out. Um, you do it the infra as code, when you do your deployments in a DevOps uh, CI CD way. Uh, you can also, <clears throat> uh, yeah, the CICD, or just deploy it with ARM templates. Uh, something that that is was pretty new, but I think it's going GA now, is that the, uh, you can enable AD authentication for the services that can write to the application insights. So if I, for example, have some functions or web apps that needs to push logs to application insights, I actually uh, authenticate with, for example, a managed identity and uh, I protect my application insights that way. Uh, otherwise you just have a connection string and a key and then you can flood the application insights with a lot of information. Uh, it's not really like a security threat or something like that. It's just annoying if if someone floods your application insights with a lot of uh, fake data. So <clears throat> that was quickly uh, Azure Monitor at a glance. So now we're gonna talk about the designing the monitor platform and uh, it's not that you design the actual Azure Monitor platform because Azure Monitor is already there. Uh, but there's a lot of considerations about how you should do with your log analytics. If you have uh, multiple applications across the world, if you have development uh, 
QA uh, production environment? Should they go through the same log analytics or different ones and so on? Uh, there could be a regulatory needs if you have PII data stored or IP addresses stored in those logs. Uh, that, that log analytics workspace needs to be secured additionally, so no uh, no access to it for other teams than uh, just specific teams. And uh, basically, similar thought and thinking needs to go into the application insights setup. So if we look at it, for example, uh, the picture on the screen here is is an uh, is an example from Architect Center about uh, Azure Monitor for an enterprise. As I said, the organization, um, if you have a monitoring team, if you have application, if you split by applications, for example, if you build it, you run it, then you are the ones that should define the monitoring part. But if you have a central monitoring team, uh, a NOC, for example, they probably have uh, some requirements that they want to look up. So it's, again, look at the requirements and build from there. Uh, also compliance-wise. Uh, I bulleted it down to use CAF, WAF, ALC. Those, those, those stands for uh, Cloud Application Framework, uh, Well-Architected Framework, and Azure Landing Zone and Arc Center. Uh, there's some checklists in the WAF and CAF uh, guidance that you can use just to, to see if you're covering all of uh, the monitoring needs for resiliency and so on. So I could recommend those resources to look up just to, to be sure that you cover all of it. And then uh, I said, as, as I said, regions, environments, and also if there's different retentions. And there's actually new capabilities in the log analytics workspace that enables you to define the retention on a table level. It's currently in preview, but otherwise you would have one workspace with 90 days, one workspace with 30 days, one workspace with additional days, depending on the needs. Now you can actually go in on, on each table level uh, table and uh, say, store this for X amount of days and then send it over to uh, cheaper storage, for example. Uh, and I also said workspaces separation, uh, for example, on identity abs regions. If you look at this picture, uh, this architecture, you can see that the identity on the top there, they, they have their own workspace. Uh, it's the gray box in the middle. <clears throat> it says workspace one. So that workspace is only for identity. And it has its own alerts settings depending on that one. So it's completely uh, outside all of the other monitoring. In this example, they also, in the if you look at Workspace 2, they have combined the SQL data, the databases in itself, in an, yeah, the databases. And they also have their own set of alerts. And then if you look at the bottom one, you have the applications. And then you also see that it's not only Log Analytics Workspace, but it's also Application Insights. And it's looking at the containers, the functions, the web apps, and it also has their own uh, alerts. And uh, the alerts are then connected to some logic apps and some automation, depending on if you want to have some uh, remediation, automatic remediation on it. If you look at the top uh, right corner, you have something called Log Analytics Workspace Insights. And uh, this is basically just data about your workspace. Uh, telling you how much data is ingested and uh, so on. It's uh, and the insights in in when we talk about Azure Monitor is uh, something that you might recall as solutions before. Uh, and we will yeah we will go a little bit into that one uh, in the coming slides. Uh, so 
what we have discussed is if you want to have a distributed architecture depending on your needs if you have central IT or application teams there's some uh, small there's some log monitor logs deployment guidance in CAF and WEF CAF is more for the infrastructure governance part where whereas WEF uh, is more for the how you build your application what you need to consider when you build your application and uh, if you start from nothing you can start with a single workspace and then build out because it, the more uh, the bigger it gets the more complex it gets of course if you have a lot of different workspaces with a lot of different uh, RBAC settings and so on but yeah so that's something that you need to think about and uh, something that that when the log analytics workspace came out uh, they have they had something called an Azure diagnostics table so every service just pumped their data into that table so we had one diagnostics table for everything what's happening now is most of the services and something that will be default for the log analytics is something called resource specific table so that means cosmos db has its own table uh, storage account has its own table so when you do a query for example you do search cosmos db and then whatever query you want to write and before you did azure diagnostics and then you would do cosmos db and so on this also in, makes it easier for to to write your queries it's easier to find stuff and also understand the schema and structure because they can be aligned to that resource it heavily improve, improves performance when you do queries and also with ingestions there's an ingestion time when logs are being pulled into the log analytics workspace uh, but the biggest gain is the RBAC where you can say that uh, team A has access to to web apps because they work with web apps so they are have our back on table level in in uh, log analytics whereas the other team that only works with uh, kubernetes they don't have access to web apps for example but uh, yeah our back uh, on uh, table level is is a really good thing when you do a bigger uh, implementation so <clears throat> this architecture of course follows that resource context log model and uh, <laughs> sends it to different uh, workspaces and here you can see that they have really uh, split it up and uh, we already walked through most of it uh, something that that uh, is not visible here is for example us, uh, you, oh yeah it is you have the Microsoft Sentinel up in the right corner and uh, that uh, connects uh, to to most of the workspaces in this one and uh, Sentinel is of course also log driven and you can do a lot of visualizations with workbooks and Power BI and uh, you can see that the logic app in the bottom right corner is uh, connecting to the ITSM tools which could be yeah whatever tool you're using service now is a pretty common one if I go further so now about the log analytics retention uh, I'll just go back one step so workspace one in this case identity might have a longer retention period where you need to store the logs let's say you have uh, 90 days at minimum uh, the database is also 90 days but the applications yeah those could be 30 days so in this case it's really easy to to divide it but what if in workspace 3 the the, con the, the function in this case is something with the financial uh, 
record it needs to be stored for very much longer uh, then you don't want to have the workspace 3 enabled for um, 360 days and store all the other uh, data there for cost purposes uh, what you can do then is uh, you can go into your log analytics one to your log analytics workspace and uh, let's see if i have data in this one <clears throat> we can look at the logs for example you can see there's a lot of tables uh, container insights log management custom logs and so on if i then <clears throat> would want to say that these logs should have uh, <clears throat> different these tables should have different retention times i can actually go in and as you can see it's a it's a preview at the moment uh, so let's say common security log yeah i don't want to have that based on the workspace which is 30 days uh, i would want to have that further uh, i would want to have that for like 180 days and so on uh, so i can i can change the retention on a table level. Uh, of course, this is good and flexible, but it also adds a bit to the complexity and, and what you need to think about when you design your monitoring state. Good. Um, the retention time. So that's the log analytics part. And then if we look at the application insights, it's pretty much similar there, right? Because uh, you have a log analytics workspace for the diagnostic logs and so on, but then now that intelligence about uh, uh, monitoring your application, that's when you need to use application insights. And of course, there's a lot of settings there that you need to think about. <clears throat> also access to it, uh, regional monitoring as it says here in the bottom uh, if you have uh, yeah different regions it could also be depending on security uh, and so on because it really looks deep into all what the application does so basically similar considerations need is uh, needs to apply on the application insights uh, inside in uh, instances. The thing with application insights today is that you can uh, connect them to workspaces, so log analytic workspaces. So that's an that's a pretty new feature that currently is GA. Is when you create a new application insights, you connect it to a workspace, and then that workspace also hosts all of your uh, data, so uh, all of your logs. So then that log uh, workspace takes precedence, of course. So that's what you need to consider, you know, should I have a different workspace for these application insights or is it okay if all these application insights uh, talk to this same workspace? Uh, but a recommendation is, of course, to have one application insights depending on the that work, uh, application. Uh, so, that's a current recommendation is that just one application insights per application so you don't unless those applications are really aligned and are doing the same thing uh, and yeah baf calf landing zone architect center uh, those are good resources to to look at <clears throat> so that was the first part of the deeper dive uh, hopefully that gave something. Now we're gonna look at alerts and action groups. So we have the Azure Monitor, we collect the data to the Log Analytics Workspace, uh, but that's only part of them monitoring, right? Gathering the data, uh, creating alerts and, and uh, action groups. That's where you actually get some, <clears throat> some uh, uh, surfaced uh, information. So alerts can be a lot of things. Uh, it can be based on metrics. It can be based on, on logs. And logs, in this case, you can do your own queries in log analytics. 
uh, so you can really narrow down whatever you want to have, be alerted on same with the metrics where you say you can set certain thresholds that if it goes over x amount of uh, minutes on high cpu send an alert and so on and that's where you create your alerts and and you define your alert rules depending on it but just if you have that alert you can go into azure monitor and look at that alert and uh, and action whatever you need to action from there so we can if i look at the monitor here i can show some uh, some of the alerts and uh, this can be pretty overwhelming as you can see uh, this is only for the past 24 hours i have a ton of alerts i have some critical and so on i don't need to look at all of these I just need to be informed if it's a critical one is a team needs to be informed. If I, yeah, I don't know why high CPU performance is, is a critical one, but sure. Uh, and here I can get uh, some information and if you can see that it's based on a query in the log analytics uh, and it can violate it one time. So all these conditions you can set. So there's a lot of tweaking to getting the right alerts aligned. But so what happens when an alert is fired? In this case, it tells something here, um, and you could have it uh, associated with a action group. So let's go back to the slide. And the action groups, that's where yeah actions happen. So if I create a lot of alerts and I tie them to this action group, in the action group, I define what should happen. There's some, I can do some automation connected to different services like functions and logic apps. Uh, I can send it to any ITSM tool, like ServiceNow. I can also send mails and, and uh, push notifications to Teams if I use uh, some logic app setting there. And uh, that's that. This is basically what you need to do with your monitor: is to have a lot of alerts and connect them to these different action groups. If we would look at, for example, uh, the action groups in this case, we have a lot of action groups: send emails and tops and so on. Uh, and we have these automatic ones, and I'll, I'll dive into those. So this this is yeah alerts and mon and action groups. That's where you need to do most of the work actually. Oh what happened now? Um so that was quick about the uh, alerts and action groups because now we're going to talk about the AI driven proactive monitoring. And I will actually cover some more about the alerts and action groups here. So, AI driven proactive monitoring. Uh, just to, to frame it, I'm going to put out a problem statement based on uh, some projects that I've been involved in. That's Agile Cloud Development. <clears throat> And that means things move fast and requirements change and uh, things that we started out building week one is not the same thing week four. Uh, and uh, and means that in at least in, in a cloud where there's stuff being automatically enabled, it, logs and metrics are everywhere. Uh, and then once something is built like an MVP, then with we start thinking about alert and error handling. Okay, what happens if something fails? Who should get notified? And what kind of alert should it be? Uh, and then you have this AI-driven, um, automatically enabled alerting. That's there. That's good, of course. But it doesn't fit the process. Uh, we don't know who's getting notified and the naming conventions of the alerts or the action groups and so on. Uh, it just something just happened to, to be there 
And if you have multiple teams building multiple different stuff, uh, it's really hard to understand what's happening. Uh, so if we would look at a reactive monitoring situation, uh, service gets an error, first line gets a message, sends the second line to investigate, and third line solves it and goes back and tries to fix it and removes the error. Okay. Uh, that's a reactive monitoring. That's when something already is has already failed. If you look at a proactive monitoring setup, uh, so there's machine learning driven AI, looks at the anomalies, performance, security events, and so on, uh, sends a message, say something is wrong. In this, one, in this case, we can send it directly to second line, and then they can go in and, and start looking at it and maybe fix something before anything ever happened. Uh, of course, that's that's the that's the good thing. And to do that, uh, we actually use application insights in this case. I'm going to do a, a walkthrough of application insights here, and uh, hopefully we will get some good good data. Uh, I'll look at an application dashboard. And just one second. Mm -hmm. So in this case, I have, uh, I have a couple of uh, services running, um, as you can see. Uh, it's pretty, it can, all, it can always be overwhelming when you start looking at it like this and uh, start to try to understand where all the, uh, all, all the data is. And uh, if I would uh, showcase an application dashboard, that, that's really good. Uh, in this case, it's <clears throat> based on, on a production environment that, that we have for demo. Uh, just need to figure out which one it was. <laughs> uh, there it was. And then let's see if I can find the right dashboard to show. Uh, I didn't want to find the cost management one. I needed to find uh, this one. Sorry. It is a production one. Okay, I'll just uh, go into application insights and take it from there. This is a better way. <laughs> and then I can go into this one and from here I can find a dashboard. Sorry about that. And so <clears throat> application insights. We talked about visualizations before, right? And uh, application insight can dig deep into all the logs and drive some uh, some logic around it. And you can also build really informative dashboards like this one, where we can look at about usage reliability. Yeah, you you have basically all the data that you need to have surfaced in one page, you, you can get surfaced in a dashboard. Uh, but again, and this is just for information and troubleshooting, right? If you have hundreds of apps, you can't go into each dashboard. And if you would put these together, uh, you wouldn't be able to, to see the forest for the trees, so to say. And uh, in this case, uh, for example, we have an application map, and now we're back in the application insights. So this is all of the uh, good stuff that's built into the application insights. Application map is a really powerful one. And uh, a pretty new thing that was added to application map is uh, this intelligent view, where it reduces noisy edges and get an uncluttered view. So there's some ML behind it that kind of triages it and tries to give you the accurate information 
about what's there and you can you know filter it on on a little bit deeper level and in this case i can see okay i have like some some red connections here if i look at the details here i get a lot of top failing requests and so on and uh, so this is data that's collected for me within application insights enabled on my app and uh, if i go into failures you see it triages it down to giving me like the top uh, top errors and if i look at this one you can see i have seven seven thousand errors but it suggests that i should look into this one because there's some machine learning telling me that this is the most common one and this is probably the one that you're looking for if i then dig down on this one i can actually you know go really deep and uh, get a lot of information all the down to the call stack and uh, if you look at an enterprise for example maybe you have an operations team that have access to all the application insights a development team might have access to this information in a development in, uh, in a development state but if uh, the application has gone to production and maybe it's a sensitive one the developers shouldn't have access to all of the information there because a trace stack like this would give you a lot of information that probably every developer shouldn't have so you in most cases in an enterprise you have a an, a team or a operations team that has the rights to do this but an operations team might not know what this means that okay we have this failure what should we do so what you can do from application insights is you can create a work item template uh, or actually create a work item uh, I don't have any templates in this one uh, because I don't have rights to do it. But what this actually does is it can open up a DevOps or a GitHub template. It gathers all the information uh, from from this one and creates an, uh, a work item that you can assign to a developer. And in that case, that developer doesn't have access to, doesn't need to have access to the production area uh environment but it still can get all the information and start developing on it and maybe correlate to the development uh, area cool uh, so if i go back to the application insights <clears throat> uh, i'm gonna show the next thing here and uh, this is another one so it's not really crucial uh, we have something called live metrics oh this one isn't the one sorry just one second i'll get the i'll i actually take a, a own one here So, so here I have an, a, a small app that, uh, you know, tells me hello. So if I click on this one, it, something should happen from bananas. And then I have something going wrong on Guava. It's not working on Guava. But the live metrics actually captures it live. And this is also really good when you do like troubleshooting. Usually if someone says, hey, that application doesn't work. Uh, can you look at it? You can open the live metrics and you actually get uh, almost every activity happening here. And uh, you can also, from here, you can also open up and get all the data that you need to, to kind of dig into the problem. That's also another feature of the application insights. Uh, then we have the transaction search. Um, and the transaction search is also you know capturing all the information that you that all the activities that are happening and here we can also see exceptions and so on uh, it's basically you know 
search through all the logs that has happened in your application. If you look at failures, it's only the failures that are collected here. Uh, whereas in transaction search, it's everything. Uh, but then for the AI driven stuff, the smart detection, So the smart detection is based on these ones. Uh, so there's some, it looks at slow page load time. So it doesn't mean that the application actually fails. Uh, it could be that the, your page load time usually is one millisecond uh, in average, and then it goes up and averages on two or three then this smart detection rule actually activates and sends out uh, an information and tells uh, someone, hey, something's wrong. And these are the alerts that have happened. So in this case, let's say, uh, degradation in server response time. It tells us that something's happening here. Uh, detected response time, 1.4 second, 1.46, and it usually is 54 millisecond. So why is this taking longer time all of a sudden? Uh, and uh, that information is proactive, of course. Uh, the problem with uh, yeah, let's uh, let's just go through these recommendations first. <laughs> uh, so one application insights per application. Uh, also think about the workspace one uh, and the log analytics recommendation as few as possible or as many as you need yeah that's pretty good <laughs> and then leverage the ai driven practice built in automatically enabled monitoring uh, but since it's automatically enabled you need to uh, you need to be aware of where and how it's enabled and the proactive one, it's part of these uh, that I showed. You have the slow page and page load time, uh, response time. You have some that's still in preview, been in preview pretty long, like potential memory leak detected and so on. Uh, and uh, what, what, these, what these do is that they uh, look at failure anomalies and performance anomalies. Uh, and I, I will show this. So now I'm going to do the walkthrough about the smart detect. Um, and I'll actually jump over to my application here and do it from this one. So I have a lot of smart detection. In this case, I don't have any errors in the last seven days. I don't think so because it's not an active application. Uh, but you saw the kind of message that it collected. And uh, here you can see, uh, just, I'm just going to rearrange my screens a little bit, sorry. And uh, so here you can see all of these. If I want these enabled, you can see that they are automatically there. When I create an application insights, these are automatically cre uh, enabled for you. So they are there whether you like it or not. Uh, but what it does, it emails the subscriptions, monitoring contributors and monitoring readers. So if you have like a monitoring team that being added to these uh, roles or given these roles, they will get this notification if they have a, a mail uh, associated. So they will get these mails. Hey, there's slow, uh, slow load time on this one. Uh, just one second. Okay. Uh, I just saw that my webcam was frozen. I'll do it like this. Sorry, I'll, should I should have been back. <laughs> uh, so if I, if I, uh, these are automatically enabled. So imagine if you have a team that has these 
and then you have different uh, different uh, development teams that are spinning up one to 10, 50 application insights instances with different apps, and they start pumping emails. Uh, you quickly get overwhelmed with information. And if you would, if you don't use this monitoring read and contributor as your uh, <clears throat> monitoring team group, you can add these email addresses instead. Uh, but then you would have to go into each of these smart detection ones and add that email here. Okay, uh, I'll speed up a little bit. Uh, that's the smart detection. And what happens is that in the monitor, if we look at the alerts here, when you create that application insights, the first one uh, actually creates... Uh, The first one actually creates an action group that's called Application Insights Smart Detection. Uh, and this action group only had this monitoring contributor and monitoring reader. So if I would add an email address into this action group, that would also be something. But this is automatically created for you and you don't you don't get to choose that. Uh, unless you actively go in and, and change it. So if I would go back to the presentation just to show what happens, is that for each application I create, it creates these failure anomalies, which are the alert rules, and it ties it to the application inside smart detection action group. So I have a brand new uh, subscription. I create one application insights. The alert rule and action group gets created. That's fine. The next one, the application insights I create, it creates a, an alert rule, but it ties it to the same action group. The problem is that if I if I would delete this first one, uh, there's no action group to capture these failure anomalies to automatically send to monitoring reader or monitoring contributor. So you would need to uh, you would need to um, control this. And if we would look at those smart detect rules that I showed, where you can add your email, uh, you, there's, you, you need to add the email directly to it for each one of these. And that's a lot of smart detect rules that you need to go in and change. So what you would do is you would do it with monitoring, with templates. So monitoring reader and monitoring contributor, that's the quick fix. If you're part of that, you'll get everything. And uh, but you would probably want to uh, control this, and that's what you can do with ARM templates. Uh, and why do you need to control it? If everything is automatically enabled, it adds confusion like who gets which mails because it's not always uh, the monitoring contributor, the monitoring reader that gets it, at least not for, for some older services. Uh, hopefully, those have been aligned now. Uh, also, would uh, I don't think uh, other, uh, I don't think that you would want to have application insights smart detection action group uh, as your naming convention. You probably have another one, so it breaks the naming convention. And as uh, if it's automatically enabled, it's outside the process of your current uh, setups, of course. And that's where you use ARM and BICEP templates to the rescue. All right. Uh, you can you can you you can control it from that that part. Okay, and the dashboards we looked at. We have talked about the Power BI workbooks. I will try to cover now, and uh, just know that there's a lot of integrations, and now there's uh, an, almost a native integration to Grafana that you can do with these visual insights. Uh, and and of course, this is based on application insights, but you can also use the log analytics information and also resource graph information can be put here. Uh, the Custo query, let's quickly go through that. I'm just a little bit stressed about the time, so I'll try to figure something out. The log analytics workspace. 
if I, for example, would go here and then I look at the, my uh, logs, you can see uh, there's a lot of different logs enabled for my, for my, uh, sorry, a lot of tables there. And there's a lot of uh, pre-populated queries that I can use. If I uh, want to look at, for example, CPU charge, yes, trend. let's see if that gives us something. Uh, you can see it's a pretty massive uh, query. Uh, let's take uh, another one. I, I have containers there, so uh, I want to just contain a lifecycle information. Maybe that gives us something. So here, and I can create rules based on this log analytics query. Uh, it gives us a lot of flexibility where you can look up stuff. Okay, uh, the workbooks, that's the next one. Uh, and this is, this is if you're familiar with something called solutions before, you probably are uh, uh, familiar with the workbooks now, or you should be because the workbooks will probably uh, they will replace the, the solutions. Uh, and a workbook is really, <clears throat> really effective. It's a lot of pre-built in workbooks for you. Uh, and you can see it's, in this case, it's uh, also really, uh, how do you say, easy to build one workbook that works for everything. Uh, and here I can see that in this resource group, I have 30 compute resources, network monitoring, and so on. And this is just the inventory. It tells me the inventory of the stuff I have. So I get a quick overview here, but I can also go into the monitoring part, whereas it could tell me all my alerts. Uh, I can do a lot of dynamic stuff, you can also look at the security part. And workbooks, if I would uh, go to monitor, you already have a lot of pre-built workbooks where you can <clears throat> where you can start to explore stuff. Uh, as you can see, if I look at the applications, failure analysis, for example, uh, it asks me for Let's look at this one. For the last hours, I clicked on, on the Guava one. It tell, gave me a lot of failures. So here's a workbook that gives me this interactive uh, interactive page. Cool. So uh, that was workbooks. And of course, for containers, uh, AKS clusters, and so on, there's a lot of uh, good workbooks being developed at the moment. So we have covered all of the agenda <laughs> and final words of advice. Uh, have a plan with your monitoring, understand what you should monitor, understand who should be notified and understand how resources are organized. That's the regional and if you need to have some, <clears throat> some audit, uh, uh, or other requirements that needs to be there. What you don't do is configure it manually. Uh, and don't monitor everything. If you do that, you'll just get swamped and don't get any value out of it. Uh, don't send tons of email, of course. And uh, do not copy what you already have on-prem. And then you, of course, need to continuously improve to, to have something working for you. And with that, I would so want to say thank you for listening. And uh, let's see if we have some questions. Thanks so much, uh, Michael. That was, that was great. Um, we do have uh, one or two questions in there. And still a little bit of time for questions. If anybody else wants to go ahead and type a question into the questions window. Um, so one that came in. 
Um, can you integrate the reports into Power BI reports? Uh, so the, you can the, the current reports uh, you can build the same stuff in Power BI, but uh, I don't think you can integrate them into them. So you would have to rebuild it in in Power BI. You have access to all that the data in that, and you can let's say rebuild them. Okay. They, I think they are. They, they. I think they're also in. If you look at the Power BI, there's some solutions for the monitoring stuff. Uh, someone's already built a bunch of of good visualizations that that you can just open. Okay. Thanks, Michael. Um, can I move an existing log analytics workspace to another Azure subscription? Uh, yes, you can, but it needs to be in the same region. So that's that's the limitation. You can not switch the regions for the uh, log analytics workspace, but you can switch subscriptions. Okay, uh, that's perfect. Looks like that's all the, the questions uh, we have. So thanks uh, on behalf of the ESPC community. Thank you, Michael, for joining us. It was a great presentation. Thank you. No problem. Okay. Um, thanks everybody for, um, for joining us today. Um, that's the end of today's presentation. Um, thanks again and goodbye. Goodbye.